In this video, we'll discuss ancient Arabian mathematics. Now, we know that around 622, Muhammad united the tribes of the Arab nation through the religion of Islam, and they went then around conquering both east and to the west, so that by 730, the caliphate had an empire that reached from Spain all the way to India. Around 766, they established Baghdad as the capital, and then also established a library where the conquered nation's works were collected and placed. Around that same time, they create the House of Wisdom, which then allowed the scholars of the Arab nation to come together, take those works, and translate them. And once they are translated, they expanded upon them and greatly improved our knowledge of many different concepts in algebra, geometry, and beyond. Now, at that time, when the House of Wisdom was established, foreign sciences were important and were seen as a way to help better understand uh, their religion. However, around 1100 CE, that starts to wane, so that while there are significant mathematicians of the Arab nation that were still doing important work well beyond 1100, 1200, 1300, it started to be replaced by religious sciences being the focus and not so much the foreign sciences. Now, the Arabian mathematicians not only uh, were able to translate the works of many of the ancient civilizations, the Babylonians, the Greeks, the Indians, but they greatly enhanced that work. The work that was done with the Greeks also instilled a need for proof in much of the work that they did, which is why so much was validated and enhanced. The work that was done by the Arabian mathematicians also greatly influenced the European Enlightenment several hundred years later. Much of the work that we think of that was done during the Enlightenment was likely uh, adapted from works that were actually completed by Arabian mathematicians hundreds of years before. Now, some of the key concepts that we attribute to the Arabian mathematicians include the improvement of the Hindu Arabic numeral system. They took the Indian numeral system, enhanced it to include both decimal numbers and decimal fractions and the number zero, and then those are the numerals that we think of now when we think about our Hindu Arabic numeral system that we use. They also overwhelmingly improved and developed our concepts of algebra. And not only did they improve those concepts, they connected the relationship between algebra and geometry, so much so that the works that we think of directly come from where they were established by Arabian mathematicians. Additionally, they took the works of the Indians in combinatorics and greatly enhanced it into an abstract system uh, that is still used today. And finally, much of the work that we think of in plane and spherical trigonometry that was enhanced the, for the next several hundred and thousand years started with the Arabians who took the works that were started by the Greeks and then greatly improved them as well. Now let's look at some of the geometry that came from the Arabian mathematicians. Uh, Muhammad Abu al-Wafa al-Buzjani was one that we know had a textbook on business mathematics. And I, I mention this because he's one of the few Arabian mathematicians that we have established actual works that show negative numbers. A lot of the other works do not show the use of negative numbers in their uh, treatises. He also improved the tables that were created by the Greek mathematician Ptolemy to include signs and tangents up to 15-minute intervals, very, very small intervals. And also, he proved the law of spherical, or the spherical law of sines and law of tangents. He's one that we actually give the credit to doing much of the work with tangents, that we don't see much work being done by tangents prior to him. And the works that uh, al wafa created were significant in helping move uh, the Arabian mathematicians after him forward in spherical geometry. Now, another important um, Arabian mathematician in geometry was Nasser al-Din al-Tuzi who was one that had significant works in astronomy and spherical trigonometry. Again, we're seeing much more advanced forms of trigonometry at this point. So much so that the work that he did as an astronomer likely led to how Copernicus created his heliocentric model of the universe or of, of the solar system. Now, he also created a book called The Treatise of the Complete Quadrilateral. It was four books together, but what that did more so than anything was connect and enhance many of the works that were known at that time of both the plane and spherical trigonometry into a singular treatise, which was important because now we have a combination of all the different works that were being done for hundreds or even thousands of years if you go back to where they've translated from other civilizations. Now, one of the most important uh, Arabian mathematicians was Muhammad Ibn Musa al-Khwarizmi, who is one of the first scholars of the House of Wisdom. 
The reason we pay so much attention to Al Khwarizmi is because he is considered to be the one that helped be the father of algebra. He also was known for many other things, such as constructing accurate maps of the known world of that time, more so than even how well the Greeks had created their maps prior to him. He's also the reason we have the word algorithm, because some of his words uh, were later cited with his name being algorizmi, which was then translated roughly to algorithm. His works on astronomy were used for hundreds of years afterwards as well, because not only was his work important in mathematics, but it was very important in astronomy as well. Now, one of the things that's interesting about his concepts of algebra, we, we know that much of what he did was through geometric construction. And the idea of proving algebraic concepts through geometric construction, we often consider to be done by the Greeks. But much of his work actually ties closer to the Babylonian civilizations than it does to the Greek civilizations. And often, he, much of what they would say would be said and stated in, instead of actually being what we think of as symbolic algebra, as symbolic algebra still did not come for several hundred years later. Uh, al khwarizmi was also an adopter of the numeral of zero, but did not work with negative coefficients or solutions. So that does limit some of the algebra that may have been done originally around this time frame. Now, the most influential work that came from al khwarizmi was the condensed book of the calculation of al-Jabra and al-Muqabla. And these were used in universities in the Western uh, Europe for up until the 1500s. And the words are very important because the word al-Jabra meant restoring, where we move subtraction of quantities from one side to the other by adding them. That term right there because of how it was roughly translated as it came into Europe, is where we get our word for algebra. The word al mukabla what meant comparing, and that's where we subtract equal amounts of a positive number from both sides. So what we're talking about here is solving equations and moving values from one side to the other. So let's look at an example. Say we have 5x plus 6 equals 22 minus 3x. When we add the 3x to both sides, that's algebra because we're restoring that value to a positive whereas then when we subtract six from both sides we're doing al mukabla and that would leave us then with the 8x equals 16 for us to then realize x should have to equal 2. Now another interesting aspect in algebra that comes uh, is the double false position and this is another just neat aspect of algebra that comes from uh, that was enhanced by the Arabians of the time. Uh, we know that this is a concept that originated in China, but it was greatly enhanced by Abu Kamil in his book of the two errors. But one of the other things, again, they weren't using symbolic algebra. Much of what they talk about is written out verbally. So the method, if we translate into how we would do it symbolically now, is you take two numbers that are lying close to but on opposite sides of a solution. We then find its corresponding ordered pair. So we substitute that value into the equation and solve it. Now we can take those ordered pairs and plug them into this equation to get an approximation for what is the value that lies uh, for the solution. If we want to enhance it, we can then take that approximation and find its corresponding solution and then replace one of those two original ordered pairs that are on the same side of the solution. So let's look at this in practice. Say we have x cubed minus 36x plus 72 equals 0. And we want to look for the solution that is between 2 and 3. First thing, let's calculate the two ordered pairs. So if I use 2, its corresponding component would be 8. If I use 3, its corresponding component is negative 9. So again, I'm on the opposite sides of my solution, or my 0. Now I'll plug these two ordered pairs into my equation. When I simplify this, I'll end up with 42 seventeenths, which is about 2 and 47 hundredths. And there's many more decimals after that. Now, if I want to then do this a second time, I would say let's find the corresponding y value with 2 and the 47 hundredths. So I substitute in the 42 seventeenths into my equation, and I'd find that its corresponding would be negative 9,144.49 And since this is negative, we're going to replace with this fractional ordered pair, this second value. So that we now have one that's on the positive side, and again, still one on the negative side. So we use these two ordered pairs, 
And yes, they're fractions, they're larger, but we can still use that uh, within the formula. And we now substitute in our values. And then we simplify, and we get 1,803 over 757. And that gives us approximately 2 and 38 hundredths, which puts us well closer to the actual value. If we wanted to go more iterations we could, we would just follow the same process. Take our value, plug it in, and then replace one of the two ordered pairs and do this again and again to get better and better approximations.